The tech heavy Nasdaq rising for the fifth day in a row here. For more on the latest moves, let's now bring in Stephen Whiting, City Wealth Chief Investment Strategist and Chief Economist. Stephen, it's good to see you. So you say here that, you. that by early next month, much of the world will be gripped in U.S. election frenzy. And I, I don't disagree with you, Stephen, but w what does that mean for viewers right now who are listening? What's it mean for investors? Well, I would look at it this way. In the last two U.S. election nights, same cast of characters with the absence of Joe Biden, um, the range on U.S. equities over the election evening was about six percentage points. U.S. yields, you report on up a couple basis points. They've ranged nearly 30 basis points uh, over the course of a day. So there's a time in which markets are going to try to very, very quickly absorb the implications of what U.S. policies will be um, as they guess uh, and perhaps said uh, who was elected president, uh, what Congress that person will have. You know, so this is the type of thing that you'll see. And what we really would be looking for as, as true long term investors, and I would imagine, again, many of your audience is if anything gets greatly exaggerated, if there's um, too much pessimism, too much optimism. Uh, that's the sort of thing that you can take advantage of uh, in the aftermath of election results. Uh, there are other ways to think about this, but um, I would also just emphasize that global markets, international equity markets may move even more than the U.S. does uh, because of the impact of U.S. policies are very different between the two candidates. And so, Steve, when investors are trying to figure out how to take advantage of this, um, one of the things that you recommend is sort of going long volatility, I guess, I, at least right around the event here. What's sort of the best way for people to think about that and do that? Well, again, for suitable investors, mm -hmm. you can think about the fact that the implied volatility on the S&P 500 is expected to be very high for that one night I mentioned, but it's expected to fall quickly after. Um, hedging costs are uh, pretty low now for a period uh, where the S&P 500 is near a record. Of course, we also have record corporate profit levels at the same time. So it's not that it really lacks an anchor. And then the other side of it is just um, using that volatility as an income source. Uh, if volatility surges, it's usually not uh, able uh, to hold that level for a long period of time. So especially if volatility um, is pushed out over a longer period uh, in terms of the options market, uh, then what happens is that there are techniques, again, for suitable investors uh, to take advantage of that and use that for entry point management, use it uh, as a source of income. You know, Steve, um, we've talked to a lot of people who have said, OK, if it goes this way, you can do this. If it goes that way, you can go that you can do that. Right. Um, you know, and we are obviously following the headlines that might affect the markets closely. One of the latest today, a, a report in the New York Times that Jimmy Dimon was sort of a closet supporter of, of Kamala Harris. Um, and even, you know, his name has been floated as Treasury Secretary before. This was something else that was mentioned in that report. Something like that, does that affect markets? If it happened, could it affect markets? How do you think about those kinds of headlines? It's a little hard to disaggregate. We just had, for example, strong employment report, a couple mild positive surprises on inflation. And you know what? Longer term inflation expectations have risen 30 basis points. Uh, but it's also been uh, as various polls and indicators uh, have seen Donald Trump's prospects uh, improve in his election probability. You know, so it could be really um, very, very difficult, again, for investors, you know, to rely on this information, um, you know, how it polls really uh, done for us. And that's why you get these big election uh, night uh, volatility spikes. And again, I've got to stand away from that. We've taken somewhat less risk in global equities, uh, in non-U.S. equities, where we have a bit of an underweight and we have a significant overweight in U.S. equity themes, you know, partly on the risk of what might happen uh, with uh, tariffs and, and other policies that are possible. Uh, but, you know, we'll take a look at that after the election result. Uh, if those things are, if we have some relief from all of those concerns, you know, then it's possible again that uh, we could shift those allocations. So I, I think, again, relying on the polls, thinking that we can 
um, out bet the market on, uh, you know, who will win, you know, that's not a risk that we want to take. Stephen, let me get your take on this earnings season. Uh, you know, we heard from the big banks, generally solid. Now big tech is on deck. Interested to get your thoughts. What, what do you make of this earnings season so far? And what do you forecast even for por corporate profit growth ahead? Well, it's broadening gains um, across industries. We came into this year um, overweight, the S&P 500 equal weight, overweight growth stocks in mid and small caps. Um, you know, specifically, again, it doesn't mean every small cap. It's not about, you know, leverage low quality companies. But the idea that we'd have more industries that could grow their earnings is, uh, you know, what we've counted on. And now you could take a look at the S&P 500 equal weight index and its return over the last 12 months. It's about 35 percent. Now, are there some industries that have improved more? Sure. Uh, but what we saw in the second quarter is that nine out of 11 sectors posted EPS gains we might be 10 out of 11 by the end of this year. Um, and it's not that we're gonna have a 40% EPS gain or something like that as if we were coming right out of a recession, uh, we're not. Uh, but again, broader gains across more industries because 2023 was a lousy year uh, for many companies. Again, excluding the MAG-7, it was a minus 7% year for S&P 500 EPS. So that is allowing us again to see so many industries that have in fact been affected uh, by monetary tightening in 2022 and early 2023. We think we can emerge from that and into the coming year. Um, again, it's not necessarily double digit gains uh, for the broad index EPS, uh, but it's a lot more widespread gains. And in fact, under some circumstances, it might be a little bit more global. Steve, great to see you. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you.